here we go. Let's get rolling. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you very much for uh, coming along to this uh, wonderful talk we're going to have this evening on uh, on corrosion and its uh, environs and such like uh, by Bill Hedges. But uh, uh, I'm glad to hear you've all come along, um, and it's going to be a very, very exciting evening. So if you could forgive us just for a few mm -hmm. moments while we uh, we go through the apologies of absence and such like. Do we have any apologies, Andrew? Uh, the only one I've had, uh, I believe, is Stuart Porthouse. Um, so that's what we have for this evening. We have um, Will Bell and we have Rick Smith. Ah, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Right. Well, in that case, uh, that's OK. Can we just uh, run through the minutes of the last meeting and get it to Yes. Our last meeting was, of course, uh, on the 20th of May, given by Professor Stephanie Glendinning from the University of Newcastle. A really interesting talk on the long linear geotechnical assets and the work of the Achilles program in developing compu predominantly computer models, which uh, in order to help assess um, railway cuttings and, uh, and so on and the like. And uh, you, it's something very interesting, and you can download on your phone uh, as a little app to tell you whether or not your railway cutting is in danger of collapse. So I think we all very much enjoyed that. Uh, and a really good attendance, and uh, I think it's been doing well on YouTube. We just need to promote it to some more geotechnical engineers. So uh, there's the minutes of the last meeting, Steve, if that's all right. Uh, do we have uh, approval? Uh, could we have a, yeah. a seconder for that, please? Anyone there? Yes, thank you, David Granger. Okay. Wonderful. There we are. Wonderful. Okay, so, Andrew. Now, yes, moving moving on to the uh, the minutes and uh, maybe a short review of the year for those who uh, haven't uh, haven't been keep, been keeping up or those who have. Uh, next, this is of course the last lecture of our twenty twenty one lecture series. But uh, don't worry, we'll be back in September for our twenty one twenty two lecture series, with the AGM and presidential address on the sixteenth of September, and more details to follow. Uh, just a quick review um, in, in lieu of any other notices. We've had an absolutely fantastic year. It's one of those years where we've all come up across uh, against a lot of adversity. But I think all of us at the Institute are, are very pleased with how all, all the uh, transition to online has gone. We've had some excellent talks on everything from jet mining to uh, land remediation, how to grow your own furniture using biomaterials to <laughs> how to stop a, a, a platinum group element mine blowing up uh, and then narrow gauge railways to nonlinear geotechnical assets. Uh, we've, of course, uh, courtesy of Norman Jackson, had our memorial lecture for the Hartley Colliery disaster. Uh, one of the jewels in the crown this year was our joint lecture, uh, joint conference with the Durham Energy Institute for two days. And uh, the videos for that are just about to go up. So make sure to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel for more. And uh, our standout lecture really was... Uh, in partnership with the Paleontological Association and the Geological Society, which has now broken well over 10,000 views on YouTube and is heading rapidly towards 15,000. So uh, uh, many thanks to Steve up, uh, up from Edinburgh for that. So it's been a fantastic year. We, we hope to see you next year as, uh, as well. Uh, to keep up with all our events, uh, don't forget to follow us online. We're on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and of course our website. And the best way to keep up uh, to all up to date with all our events is of course to send us in a, a membership application and this will give you great access to all of our excellent events such as lectures and conferences like the one you're on, uh, attending at the moment our annual dinner where a range of professional men and women from across the north uh, come together and, and talk talk uh, really interesting subjects and have an excellent dinner uh, working on socials for next year and again <laughs> hopefully one, one day we'll have an international field trip uh, maybe give it another six months to um, again, don't forget, uh, plenty of benefits of membership, so check out our website for some more information and apply today. And uh, with that, I shall pass, pass, uh, pass it back to you, Steve, and uh, we can get underway. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. That's absolutely wonderful. Well, here we are. We have Bill Hedges. Uh, we're proud to present uh, this lecture uh, in partnership with the uh, Royce organisation. And uh, as a, a brief description of who Bill is, I'll, uh, I'll tell you that Bill's an independent uh, corrosion consultant and the current president of the Institute of Corrosion. He has a BSc in chemistry, a PhD in electrochemistry, uh, specializing, I believe, in uh, lithium batteries uh, from the University of Southampton and spent his uh, time as a researcher in the uh, bioengineering department at Oxford. Uh, Bill has uh, 34 years experience in corrosion science, integrity management, 
in engineering and has spent the last 30 years in the oil and gas industry working for Exxon and BP, if I can uh, promote them. Uh, yeah, he was with BP for 24 years and left in 2020 to form his uh, own consultancy business. Uh, and his final role uh, there was as chief engineer for materials and integrity management. He spent half of his career working in central engineering functions and another half in uh, operational locations in many countries worldwide with specific assignments in London, Houston, uh, Trinidad and Alaska. And uh, these assignments have given him uh, practical experience of integrity issues in onshore, offshore, deep water, tropical, desert and Arctic environments. Bill is a chartered engineer, uh, CNG, a chartered chemist and a fellow of both the Institute of Corrosion and the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, he has held director roles with the National Association of Corrosion Engineers uh, Foundation and the, the NACE uh, European Board. He's published 38 papers and in 2009 was awarded the National Association of Corrosion Engineers uh, Fellow Honour. So there we are. We have uh, a good speaker this evening and uh, I can't say any more than give him praise. Uh, so I say no more and I'll hand it over to you now, Bill. Steve, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, so thanks for this opportunity to, to speak on this and, and Andrew for the in, invite. I'm going to um, talk about uh, degradation of structural materials uh, for UK net zero 2050. And um, really it's, it's the three words in the beginning of this title that are the most important. Uh, uh, structural materials and their degradations. They're, they're the three key words. And um, what I'm gonna do initially is just tell you a little bit about the Henry Royce Institute. Who, who have taken the lead on this work. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the UK's um, objectives for UK Net Zero 2050, which I'm sure many of you, maybe all of you know about. And then I'll jump into the work uh, that, that we've been um, doing here. So first of all, um, you see in the top right-hand corner of the slide, it's, it's actually the, the the formal name of the Institute is the Henry Royce Institute, but going forwards, everybody abbreviates that just to the Royce Institute. So you'll see the Royce, but it formally is the Henry Royce uh, Institute. Um, the Henry Royce Institute is the UK National Institute for Advanced Materials, um, and it's all around research and innovation. You can, um, it, it, it's sort of main hub, as you can see in the bottom left circle there, is the Royce Hub building at the University of Manchester, but it comprises a consortia of a whole range of um, very advanced materials, uh, uh, research laboratories and facilities. And so it's often regarded as a, as a national institute but with a regional footprint. And it, it was kicked off with a, a big grant from the EPSRC, that's the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, um, the ability to build uh, some, some new facilities, buy a lot of equipment, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm not going to speak to all of these uh, facilities here. Um, many of you will, will know about them and know what they can do. Royce really um, has a real focus on sustainable materials. So advanced materials for a sustainable society is, is, is the tagline. And again, I won't go through every word here, but you can see there are five key themes that Royce focus on. Um, one of them we're going to talk about in a minute, which is the transition to, to zero carbon or net zero. Another is around sustainable manufacturing, um, and that covers everything. Um, digital communications, how, how do you store information using minimal amounts of energy? Um, improving the circular economy, 
how do we how do we make sure we we don't have waste uh, and if we do have waste how do we make sure it's it's um, degradable um, and the health and well-being of of people how do we how do we create a clean environment so kind of five key themes um, for Royce um, mission pillars as they call them again I'll, I'll let you read them there I, I would highlight number two and number three here. Number two, um, providing access to the latest facilities. Royce has access to world-leading cutting-edge equipment, um, particularly, you know, it shows a microscope there, but I would say particularly in the area of surface analysis and understanding surfaces, um, phenomenal access to equipment there. And, and number three, which is really how I got involved with this project, catalyzing uh, collaboration, how, get it, bringing people together who maybe wouldn't normally come together, but to work on a problem um, and look for broader solutions than we might look for um, independently. And finally on Royce, I'll just say, um, again, show this slides, but show this slide, but um, you, you can see, uh, a range of research areas here um, that, that go from nuclear to atomic materials, a um, whole range of research activities underpinned at the bottom, you can see there, by a real focus on um, understanding mechanistically what's going on and, and creating and understanding the modeling of processes and, and that's built on uh, the ability to image and characterize uh, materials in great detail. So a quick introduction to Royce um, there. And now a quick introduction to um, UK uh, net zero commitment, which is actually by 2050. And um, I'm sure many of you know this, uh, Came, this commitment was um, enshrined in law uh, just almost two years ago now, and um, we were the first uh, major economy in the world to legislate to end our um, contribution um, of greenhouse gases um, by, 20, by the year 2050. It requires us to re reduce all those emissions to zero, net zero. Um, and that's an absolute target, and that's important um, because the previous target, uh, as with many countries, was a relative target, which talked about requiring a minimum reduction by 19 versus 1990 levels. And you start to get into kind of debates about well, what really were the levels back in the 1990s. So by going for net zero, it's an absolute target relatively easy to determine whether you're there or not. The, the paper that came out in 2019 um, pointed out that not only would this be good for the environment, but there were to be expected some um, other benefits for, from this legislation as well. Uh, they saw growth in what they call green collar jobs, environmentally friendly type jobs, um, of, of 2 million jobs, which is you know, a, a massive number of, of jobs. And they also anticipated that by um, us driving this change, we would grow our own exports in the low carbon economy to somewhere short of 200 billion a year, because we would be leading um, in, in these technologies. So a, a good thing to do with some very positive benefits. Um, this was, has been followed over the last few years by numerous papers and studies on how do we get there? What do we need to do? Uh, you, you, you will regularly see these things popping up um, on the news. And literally just a couple of months ago in, in April, um, there was an update. There have been several updates to this, but they brought the government brought in a new target of um, wanting to reduce our emissions. Now, now we're going back to the relative target here, reduce our emissions by 78% um, by 2035 compared to 90 levels. And what that actually means is that 
we would get to about 75% of the reduction we need to get to net zero by 2050. And I think I, 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 my sense is that this was brought in because when you think about 2050, that just seems a long way away. You know, in my simple language, that's still 30 years away. Um, 2035, that's sort of in the 10 to 15 year frame, much more closer to hand, maybe more uh, achievable in getting your head around how close that is. And so what that will do is it will accelerate the decisions that have to be made. How are we, how are we going to achieve that? So it's, a, it's actually a very important um, piece of legislation. It's also a very ambitious uh, piece of legislation. So that's a little introduction to um, the net zero commitment. And now I'll, I'll move on to the main topic for the, this evening. Um, which is the, the study we've done this year on looking at um, the structural materials degradation issues that could impact us getting to net zero. In other words, what, what's going on um, with materials today that could prevent us getting to, to net zero? Uh, as I said earlier, this is um, has been led by the Royce Institute, um, who chose uh, Fraser Nash, uh, who are a well-known consultancy company, to to help with this. And it was this exercise has been funded by the e EPSRC. It's to look at degradation issues affecting structural materials. That word "structural" is very important, and um, it's seen as being potentially critical to delivering the goal that we want to get to by 2050. And it, the idea was to do the exercise fairly quickly. So it becomes a land, what we call a landscaping exercise. And, and hence the little picture of a landscape behind here. It's, it's what does the landscape look like now? when it comes to degradation. It's not intended and it's not a roadmap of how we're going to deal with degradation issues uh, going forwards. It had a primary, there were several mini objectives, but the primary objective was to say, where, if we're gonna get there, what R&D uh, investment should the UK do in order to accelerate or get us to the net zero transition. So particularly, are there any degradation issues that could slow our progress there or even prevent us you know, getting there? Um, for example, if, if the wind industry said, we're never gonna get there because every time we build a, a wind structure, it corrodes in five years and we're just not gonna make it. Is there anything that's a problem in getting there? We want to make sure that the, we get there in a safe, timely and efficient manner, of course. And a, a, a piece of this was to say, um, we might see issues in specific industries, but are there any topics that are common to several industries where we could focus our R&D and therefore become much more efficient and get more value for that investment? And really, this is what we've done is a convening activity. It's a networking activity to bring together the relevant UK materials community and provide an opportunity to show what this landscape is. So it's, it's been enabled by Royce, but Royce would be the first to say they don't own this study. The outputs will be available to everyone. And well, I'll come on to that in the next slide. The scope um, is focused on five industries which were felt to be critical for the transition to um, net zero. Um, they're listed here. I don't think there'll be any surprises here. The, the first three are essentially around um, producing cleaner electricity and cleaner power. So 
uh, wind, obviously, and the UK is a is a leader in in wind power generation. We've been doing it for many years, uh, and we we have a lot of wind power in this country, and we export a lot of that technology as well. Um, nuclear fission, again, an existing industry, um, which is uh, a, a non greenhouse gas emitting industry. Some people might argue it has other issues, but it is a a, a way of getting to net zero. We, we were clearly told not to talk about fusion because that is the topic of a separate uh, exercise. Um, hydrogen production and usage, so substituting in particular hydrocarbons, uh, which do produce CO2, for hydrogen, which produces no CO2. When you burn hydrogen, it only um, produces water. Um, and then transportation industries. Um, can we make these transportation methods more efficient, uh, use less fuel, use cleaner fuels? And we, we actually were asked to look at all four of, of that I've labeled there, air, road, rail and sea. And finally, there are going to be cases where we, we will not be able to quickly wean ourselves off of uh, hydrocarbons. So if we are going to use hydrocarbons, there's a whole industry. Um, in fact, there's a huge project in the, in the northeast um, around carbon capture and storage, which are abbreviated to CCS. So they were the industries we were going to look at. Um, so you might be wondering why myself, um, who worked for the oil and gas industry, was here. And, and that's simply because of my background in um, de degradation and in particular corrosion. Um, for the approach taken, um, what we wanted to do was get input from key industrial and academic experts who are working in the degradation area but with materials on a day-to-day -day basis. And we were only given three months to um, do this survey. So having thought about it for a little bit, we decided the only way we, we could do this on any sensible time scale was to develop a questionnaire type survey. Um, and I won't go through it on the right, it's just a little diagram of how we, how we developed that survey. Um, but it was essentially targeted at experts that we knew or were told about in the materials degradation industry who are working in the renewable sectors that I've just shown you. And actually, we also put it out um, on social media for anyone maybe we missed or anyone who had a particularly strong viewpoint. But it was really the targeted experts that uh, were the most important. We formed a core working team. Uh, there were four of us. Um, there was Dr. Andrew Bofield from Royce, uh, myself, and two of the consultants from Fraser Nash. We also, um, in addition to the core working team, we had a steering team, which was made up from leading academics. And we used them to basically test our ideas, test the surveys, get contacts to, to reach out to and test the findings that, that we came up with. When we'd got the responses in from the questionnaire, we obviously collated them and I'll show you a little bit of that in a, in a little while. Um, we reviewed the findings with a, a, um, an invited selection of sector experts um, to, to really firstly test does this sort of feel right? This is the information we've gathered. Does this sort of resonate with you? Um, and, and to test, um, have we missed anything? And then what we're doing finally at the moment is we're developing the, the landscape white paper, which probably will be finished by the end of this month, may, maybe early July. So that was the approach taken. Um, the, the questions... Um, some were very specific and some were very open ended. Uh, firstly, we gave people a very 
open-ended opportunity, not even to talk about degradation or materials and say, in your sector, so if you're in... Um, if you're in aerospace, for example, air transport, you know, what, what are the opportunities and challenges that you see there? And we got a whole variety of things back. Some were related to materials, but others were uh, had a much broader um, insight. But then we did ask people to say, OK, in your industry or industries, because several people work in several of these industries, um, what, what are the biggest degradation issues for you? And where they had more than one, we asked them to rank them in, in importance. We also asked them to suggest if they had the money, where would they place their research priorities to address the degradation concerns? Which, which degradation concerns did, did they feel needed the most research? Um, we asked them then a couple of interesting questions around um, if we if we need to do research in degradation, how good do you feel the UK would be at doing that kind of research? And, and then related to that, we asked them if, if that research developed something useful, how, how good would the UK be at commercialising? Um, those developments and turn them into something practical. And I'll, I'll, I'll just show you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, as you can imagine, we survey, we got some quantitative input and that was helpful. It allowed us to, to scale and compare um, our results. We also got a lot of qualitative input and I'm going to show you a fair bit of that. It was all very good, but it's maybe more difficult to, to put it in an, in an absolute sense. And inevitably, um, I, would, I would give a, a caution that um, we've summarised all of these responses. So there is inevitably some subjectivity in how we've, how we've pulled all of that together. We were delighted with the responses that we got. Um, we had 41 um, in responses from individuals and organizations. Uh, and I've, I've just listed them there. The first two columns are from industry and the right hand column um, is from uh, universities. We're all dealing with degradation issues on a, on a routine uh, basis. So really um, great responses. Um, of the 41, um, several people or uh, companies actually were involved in multiple sectors. So when we broke the, the inputs down, we actually had 123 specific inputs, which was wonderful. We were, we were hoping we might get 50 or 60, but to get 123 was, was great. And, and the, the top right hand graph um, just shows you how those responses uh, came out across those different uh, industry sectors. So some good responses in every area and, and fairly evenly um, balanced. M maybe um, slight bias to wind and nuclear fission, uh, probably because they are the more mature uh, industries, particularly in the UK. Um, and as, as you will have seen from the previous slide, what was also really good was um, we got a lot of input from industry uh, as well as academics. And that's what we really wanted. We wanted the industrial in, inputs. So I'm kind of going to jump and give you the, some of the answers straight away, and then I'll go through them in a little bit more detail. Uh, but probably of the most important finding was nobody saw any showstoppers. Nobody said there is an issue that is going to stop us developing wind energy or stop us uh, developing cleaner engines or stop us developing carbon capture. There were no showstoppers, which was great. But as you might expect going out to engineers, we were given numerous opportunities of things that could be improved upon where we could do better. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of that. 
we got um, two kinds of input. One is input that was very specific to a particular industry. Um, so, for example, um, degradation of graphite in nuclear reactors is very specific to the nuclear industry and doesn't come any in any other topic. So some very important sector specific topics. And, and I'm really not going to discuss those in this presentation because I think it's given the time, I think it's more interesting to jump to the more cross sector topics and opportunities, the, the things where people saw commonality across several several of the sectors. And, and that's what I'm going to go on into right now. Um, we had a real challenge deciding how to cut and slice and dice uh, the inputs that we got. So, and I'll, I'll just give you a feel, feeling for that um, with, a, with a few uh, slides here. But uh, you've seen already um, five sectors that we, we addressed. And you kind of could almost argue it's eight, really, given that there's air, road, rail and sea in, in there as well. So a, a bunch of sectors. And what came from the surveys was was really 21 degradation topics. And I'm just going to hold it a little bit for a moment here and let you look at this list. Um, these are not degradation mechanisms, they're degradation topics. So as you look down that list, you'll see some of them are uh, mechanistic in nature, like fatigue and creep and corrosion, th things that uh, as engineers you'll be very familiar with. But, but there were things that came up around, um, we might need new materials, we might need better standards, uh, better test methods. Um, there's issues with recycling. For, I don't, for example, today, um, wind turbine blades are made from composites or various polymers, carbon fibers, and they're not recyclable today. And all of them go, all uh, failed and end of life blades currently go into landfill, which is a big issue. So there were some really, really good um, degradation topics that, that came up. There are 21 of them. And I'll, I'll, I'll show those a few more times as we go forward. Um, we found that when we looked at the responses, um, we could put them into to six material groupings in a way. Um, metals and alloys for low temperature, metals and alloys for high temperature, so low and high metals. Coatings for low temperatures, coatings for high temperatures, uh, um, a grouping of composites and polymers. And, and interestingly, uh, which surprised us when we first saw it, but on reflection has not surprised us, um, quite a lot of feedback on concrete uh, and some of the degradation issues associated with concrete. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that later. And then we found that we could group a lot of the inputs into six themes, um, design and manufacturer. Well, you can see them there, modeling, maintenance, knowledge, and leadership was a big one. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a moment as well. Um, so we've spent a long time playing with these groupings. And to some extent, one of the delays in, in, in getting our paper completed is trying to work out the optimum way to, to, to talk about the input that we got. But let's jump to some of the input. Um, this is a heat map. Uh, I hope the color renders OK on your screen. It, it, it should be sort of darkish reds and, and pinks and, and white. Um, and what you've what you've got here is um, on the left hand column, th they're those um, degradation topics that I showed you earlier, the 21 uh, that are going down from fatigue down to characterization of materials. And, and the heat map shows them against those six groupings of high and low temperature alloys, high and low temperature coatings, composites and polymers and concrete. And what you can see from that heat map, just visually, I, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this, but if you look at corrosion, you can, which is the third 
um, row down. You can see that that um, cuts across all of those materials uh, groupings in one way or another. Um, and it's the, the, the darker color, which what, what that's telling you is that corrosion came up very commonly uh, across all of those material groupings area. I, I'll, I'll pick another one that may not be quite so obvious. Um, it's sort of down here in, in the middle. I don't know if you can see my cursor moon. It's, it's called lifing, which is a word we've sort of made up, I think. Um, but it's around the um, requirement to be able to determine the long-term life of a structure. How can you predict the long-term life of a structure? And a lot of input saying we would like to understand long-term life management much better. So that's one way we, we, we group them. Um, another way was by the industry sectors. And again, I'm not going to dwell on it, but you can see corrosion, absolutely one of the strongest issues across all, all industries. Um, and I'll, I'll summarise it at the bottom there, but when you distill down the data, um, you may not be surprised to know that it's some of the oldest phenomenon that, that we're all familiar with that remain as some of the most common and problematic degradation mechanisms, which is corrosion, fatigue and creep. And um, as you can see, there's, there's lots of other things, but those three things really still appear uh, as, as issues um, ac across all of these industries. <clears throat> Maybe not surprising, um, I'll use one of my corrosion slides here, but um, you may well know that corrosion remains a global problem. And uh, the latest estimate um, of the cost of corrosion worldwide is that it's about 3.4% of worldwide GP, GDP. So in other words, corrosion costs the world about 2.5 trillion US dollars every year. 2.5 trillion dollars. Um, if you're like me, you can't get your head around that number. It's too big. Um, in 2020, the UK's GDP was 2.8 trillion dollars, 2.83 trillion dollars. So um, the cost of corrosion worldwide is roughly equivalent to uh, the whole of the UK's annual GDP. And if you if you apply that 3.4 percent, and remember this is an estimate, it's just not an exact science doing this. Um, but if you apply that 3.4 percent to our economy, you know, where's it, corrosion's costing us around about 100 billion dollars uh, a, a year, and still a, a, a really significant problem for the UK. The chart on the right um, really is a timeline: uh, the years on the bottom and and um, percentage of GDP on, on the y-axis. Um, really, the data points are when those individual studies were done. So if I pick on the UK, really, the only big study we've ever done was back at 1970, which was the Hall report that uh, some of you may remember, a very influential report in, in getting the UK very focused on the problems of corrosion. And then other countries over the years have, have done similar studies. Um, interestingly, and this would be a completely separate discussion, but it's reasonable to ask. It doesn't seem like corrosion engineers have done a very good job because the cost of corrosion seems to have been, you know, in the range of one to three percent forever. And why haven't we done any better on that? Um, that's one for another time. But corrosion came up in our survey. Corrosion is known to remain a, a global problem. Um, I mentioned th those um, questions earlier on around uh, how does the UK um, stand in regards to doing research in degradation mechanisms and how does it stand um, when it comes to commercialising that research? And um, I, we broke that out into some different topics which are along the 
X axis there. We, we ask them to say, for example, in inspection and monitoring, how good are we at research? How good are we at commercializing? Um, the blue bars are for the ability to do research and the orange bars or columns are the ability to commercialize. Um, what, what you can see from this graph is that actually UK is very strong um, in both areas of research and commercialization, really, um, across all the categories that we asked about. Uh, but it is interesting to note that almost everybody felt we were better at doing the research than we were at turning things into commercial opportunities. And I think that's a very interesting finding from the UK. Uh, again, whether that's absolutely real or not, I don't know, but that was a very consistent view across all of our respondents. So now I'm going to um, briefly go through, as I said, some of the cross-sector findings. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some sector-specific findings, but I'm not going to talk about those. And, and to save on a bit of time, um, I mentioned earlier that we we come up with six groupings. I'm going to talk about five of them. I'm not going to talk about characterization and testing in, in this talk. So let's jump into it. Um, design and manufacture. I think everybody on this uh, webinar is, is an engineer. And honestly, I don't think you'll be very surprised at um, uh, some of the context that was coming out from our survey. But in design and manufacturer, there was a very strong belief that we needed to take a much longer term view on structures and that it has become common for projects, all projects, big and small, to be driven much more by capital expenditure, the money you spend on developing and building a project um, and short term return on investment than thinking about the longer term. How long is it going to last? And so, for example, there was a, a, a view that where, for example, corrosion was a problem, we should be using more corrosion resistant alloys versus, for example, carbon steel. It's a very consistent view there. Um, somewhat interestingly, but related to that, was some very interesting thinking around not only should you use more alloys, but the government or someone should subsidise the cost of those alloys so they can be more widely used. Be and again, this circles back to the whole capital expenditure piece of if, if, if people are constrained by the money they have for a project, but in the long run, that's going to hamper or reduce our effectiveness at getting to net zero. Why not subsidize that up front and reap the benefits later on? Maybe a, uh, a bit naive, maybe a bit of a nirvana, but a, an interesting thought. Um, involved degradation engineers early on and at the design level. Um, with a, an understanding that often people who do design are often not typically knowledgeable about degradation. Um, and some really good examples were given here. Um, but for example, in the wind industry, the guys in the wind industry who deal with degradation made the point that initially a lot of the wind industry was developed and promoted by power engineers, electrical engineers, and didn't give a lot of thought to degradation and long-term structural reliability. And as a consequence to that, we have seen some very um, hard problems with wind turbine structures corroding, failing, uh, every part of the structure, the, the, the monopiles that go in the ground, the support structure, um, the, the wires that connect various pieces of electrical equipment together from, from the generators to wherever the power is taken. 
and and the observation was made by people in the wind industry that actually if you look at for example offshore wind a lot of the problems that have been that have emerged over the last 20 years have actually been solved by the UK's oil and gas industry over the last 50 years but a lot of that knowledge was not transferred to the wind industry because the engineers involved were not really um, interested in, in those problems. And actually now we have some of our structures, wind structures offshore reaching the end of their, their life. Um, design manufacturer, develop common standards. Um, so everyone's working to the same specifications. Um, that, that minimizes waste. Uh, it allows things to be maintained more easily. And there was some input for um, from some people. And when, when you're looking at complex structures, look at the whole structure. And don't just look at a bit of it and say, I can improve that piece there. Um, because take, doing it piecemeal can keep problems in. So, so for example, a, a, a really good example was given in the, in the aircraft industry, is if you, if you look at aircraft wings and um, decide you can improve an aircraft wing, but you fail to look at the overall structure of the aircraft, you may be retaining problems in other parts of the aircraft that if you'd looked at the thing holistically, you could fix. Some really good things coming out of design and, and manufacture. Um, I've, I've picked together three topics here on one page, just to, in the interest of time. But modeling and, and simulation, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, a view that we really do need better life prediction and life extension capability so that we could avoid early repairs and replacements that often, often a feeling we were maybe sometimes too conservative um, and repaired or replaced things before they needed to be done. Um, and developing improved test methods to uh, allow long-term life prediction to be done. On maintenance and inspection, very strong view of, it's all very well thinking about the future, but actually we've got a whole load of infrastructure in place now. So make sure you look after that now so that again, we can avoid repairing and replacing um, earlier than we would like. A feeling that in the degradation industry, we should be using more sensors to monitor degradation, uh, more real time monitoring. Uh, quite a common theme. Knowledge and data management, another area, um, clearly a view of we should share more data, a, a view that manufacturers of equipment and even the operators of equipment often keep data confidential. Um, there were several reasons put forward to that, which I, I won't go into now. Um, but without sharing of data, we, we, we are going to be hampered and slowed down on how we improve. Um, develop people who have the skills to control degradation in all the renewable industries and at all levels, all the way from technicians to engineers. Um, We've got a lot of great training, but there is a lot of similarities between some of the renewable industries and existing industries. I, I mentioned, for example, offshore wind and oil and gas earlier, um, but there are differences that we have to recognize as well. And a view that we would like to have a common forum for, for sharing uh, data uh, and information. And finally, um, leadership and policy. Um, we were thinking obviously about research and it was very common message came across of, um, look, if you're going to do research into these topics, you've got to remember that when it comes to getting money for research, um, most proposals require novel content, new content. Um, the word that was often used was sexy content, um, what, you know, nanomaterials or buckyballs or whatever. And, 
And so getting research money for looking at things like steel and concrete um, is actually quite difficult. They've been around for hundreds of years now um, and they're not sexy. So something's got to be done there if we're going to improve. And um, one of the stats that came out was you know, concrete's really a huge contributor to carbon dioxide emissions. In fact, it's about 8% worldwide of carbon dioxide emissions. So really the big prize there, um, but very hard to get funding to do research on concrete. And a view of, um, if you're going to take the long-term view on this, and, and you're, we're really thinking out to 2050, um, we need to be thinking about funding durations because most postdocs uh, only last one or two years, fellowships five years. And once these folks do their research, they move on to something else. And that expertise is lost. <clears throat> so um, we need to think about the length and duration of, of some of these projects, not saying everything, but some of these projects. Um, finally, a view across the board of high level leadership is required um, so that we get co a clearly communicated strategy on how to get there. And um, there were many examples uh, g g given or comparisons given, but the, given the timing of this study, people uh, often pointed to um, the great progress we've made in tackling COVID in the last year and that with the right senior leadership and the right setting of targets, the UK can achieve a massive amount. So the view was leadership is needed from very senior policymakers um, and they will need input from, from, from the academics and industrial people, but it needs to come at a very high level. And it, what we do needs to be prioritised because we can't do everything. Um, and when you look in many sectors, there are a range of opportunities that are competing with one another. And, it, you know, there's no point, for example, in developing a more efficient uh, hydrocarbon combustion engine for cars if we are going to mandate that all cars are going to be electric. So there's a, it's really important to get the priorities right of what we want to do. And that will provide confidence then for investors and the research community. It will encourage um, collaborative efforts. Um, we quite like the idea of what's being done um, with the Faraday battery challenge. You know, create a very results focused challenge to bring some impetus um, to this. So pretty much that's what I wanted to say. Um, it gives you a snapshot of where we are, what the study was. Uh, it was brief. I apologize. We can't do more. Um, but hopefully you'll get, well, you will be ha have access to the final report when it comes out, hopefully within the next month or so. So it just remains for me to say thank you very much. Um, and if you did want to know any more, um, at Royce, the primary contact would be Andrew Bowfield. Uh, and I've put his email there, um, but you could also contact me if you ever needed to, and I've put my address there. So thank you very much. Excellent, lovely. Well, thank you very much again, Bill. Um, so are there any questions from the floor at all? Great. Anyone? I, I saw. I saw Derek. Derek picking his uh, picking his ears up. Yeah, that's Steve. Yes, um, I'll ask a question, Bill. Um, uh, it's the task you have. It seems unsurmountable to to me, um, <laughs> and most other people, I think. Um, but if we're going to have to save the world, if you like, if you want to be dramatic, then this is what we've got to do. Um, and I've got to admire for doing that. I'm a bit disappointed there's not more people here tonight to listen to you because I think it's absolutely amazing what you've said. The question I'd like to ask is, 
when can you see any movement in this project? Is it going to take years or is it going to be a, a much quicker than that? Or, um, you know, what's your thoughts about that? It's a great question, Derek. And, and um, one we're thinking about right, right now, you know, the real thing is we've got a lot of input and if we throw it all out there, it will bamboozle everyone and everyone will go, wow, there's all these different things we can do. And as ever, we won't focus and we won't do anything properly. So the, the, the real challenge we're wrestling with right now is what needs to be the real primary focuses? I am incredibly optimistic about this. If we can get some real focus, we've seen from the responses that the UK is well set up to tackle any of these challenges if we really want to. Um, I, I think we could, we will, as, as materials and degradation engineers, we will be able to play our part and make sure we, we achieve the 2035 and 2050 targets. We'd current, to be more specific on your question, mm -hmm. we're sort of currently looking at what could we do in the next five years that would have the biggest impact and what might take, for example, 10 to 20 years to develop? I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example. I'll jump into nuclear. The nuclear guys are absolutely adamant that we need a test facility where you can actually put real materials in, an, in a radioactive environment and understand how they behave. We don't have that facility properly today. They would love that. That isn't going to happen in the next two years. That's going to take some time to develop. But there are other things uh, that we could get after really quickly. So I'm giving you a terrible answer. It's we could do some things very quickly and other things will take a lot longer. Uh, th thanks for that, Bill. Uh, from a, a selfish point of view from the Institute, there's a lot of talks that we can see coming from you that would, to keep us up to date. <laughs> and, and I think that would be wonderful. Well, um, be delighted to do that. And, and you know, <clears throat> hearing from some of the other guys as well would be really interesting. Um, I, it's just been so much fun for me coming from oil and gas, which is by any definition a polluting industry. Uh, I'm a great fan of oil and gas. It's got its place, but it, we need to transition away from it. Um, to do this, this piece of work with Royce has, has been really great fun. And I just feel the UK is really well positioned to, to take advantage of this uh, transition opportunity. Thank you, Bill. Lovely. Did uh, Steve, did you have your hand up just a moment ago? Oh, are you? Steve, you're Perfect. muted. Yes, there we are. Uh, simply, uh, you know, it was that uh, you're saying that, you know, it would be very important if we can uh, be uh, more implementing more data sharing across industries. Um, have you any ideas of how you can go ahead and do that? Because engineers are notorious for not liking to give the secrets away. Yeah, Steve, that's a great question. We, we are absolutely wrestling with that one. There is no easy answer to that. <clears throat> I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think you would all have personal experiences. I can give you mine, which is in oil and gas. 25 years ago, we would talk openly about our failures what the problems were, how we got ourselves into that position in, in the hope that people would learn and never make that same mistake again. And then for various <clears throat> reasons, which I might mention words like lawyers and money, um, we clammed up and we stopped sharing because you're going to, you know, make yourself vulnerable. Um, and I'm not talking specifically about my old company. I'm talking about the oil and gas industry generally. Um, so sharing is, is, is a real issue. And what we've, what we've talked about is there has to be a safe space for doing that. Um, but yeah, your point is absolutely spot on. It's, it's a challenge. Um, <clears throat> some, someone did mention that we should use a, a, a body like 
maybe the Institute of Corrosion, IOM3, you know, the uh, NPL. There are organisations that could potentially act. You guys could act as hosts for, for something like this. Royce could very much act as a host for this. Uh, you know, an unbiased um, group. But Steve, you're right on the money. Would the engineers come and share and would their companies allow them to share what's really important? Yes. yes. Right, thank you very much indeed. Would anyone yes, else yes. like to ask a question? No. I tell you what, I, I can I can monopolize it, uh, monopolize for a bit. Um, yes, it's a, it's a shame that uh, our man in Texas has had to leave leave early, as I, I'm sure he uh, he would have had uh, a lot of questions for you, Bill. Um, Maybe that's a good thing then. <laughs> so I mean, th there's a lot of this. Um, I appreciate you've been looking at more, maybe a couple of narrow sectors, but there's, there's a lot of this which is really quite interlinked. And if you look at the, the 10 point plan from the government and you go through and you, you say, oh, right, well, you know, it's quite broad. But when you look at the particular materials topics on, on offer, they're all the same things cropping up again. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, are, are people properly linking all these areas together or are people focusing too much on batteries for one type of transport? And then they, they're they not really sort of seeing how you could scale that, to, that up to marine or something like that. Um, are, are, is there enough conversation going on in the, even in academia, if not in industry? That's a great question. Um, I think some people are linking it up, but my simple answer would, to you would be not yet. They're not linking it up. They're not linking all of it up in the way that we've identified in this short, but actually quite impactful study. Um, and I would say policy makers have not linked it all up yet. Um, I think when you've got a simple message like, we need new batteries and new energy storage, that's, that's kind of nice and self-contained. When you say, we've got all these metals and concrete and plastics and they're all failing and we need a way to pull that all together it's mind numbingly broad and it's not a simple box message. And I think we have to find the way to communicate that message more clearly. So I think my answer to you is not yet, but the focus is on us to find a clear way to deliver the message. It's, I, I, I want to be cautious just to not stand back and say, they don't get it no. when when really they is us. <laughs> yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, I, I suppose we've got the um, I've got a question about the metallurgy as well. Uh, of course, a lot of the a lot of the steel industry, you know, it's either it seems to be focused on bulk, or, and uh, a lot of it's been closing down. Um, do we have the capacity to actually, do, yes, um, move into all these specialist alloys, or, or is that again something which we're now going to have to say, well, in ten years' time, we need this, so this we're going to have to grow the industry or or shunt it in a certain direction. Um. Another great question. Def this definitely came up. Um, it's a little bit related to Steve's comment as well about people not wanting to share because a, a lot of feedback that we have great engineers in this country, absolutely brilliant engineers, but a lot of them work for um, manufacturers and supply industries that are owned by companies that are not UK companies. So here we're talking about UK net zero, um, how do we build those industries? Do we have the capacity to do the things we want to do? We've got the research capacity. We absolutely believe that. Do we have the industrial capacity to do some of these things? Um, I think that's an open question at the moment. And I think that's where the, the, the feedback around policy and leadership comes into play. Um, we, we need these industries. Mm. Um, do we have the capacity? I can't answer that. No, that's, that's fair enough.
And uh, one one final question, and I'll I'll hand you back uh, back to Steve. Um, you, you you of course picked up on uh, leadership, and um, I mean we we do work closely with IMMM, uh, but as as a regional organisation, um, I mean the North. We've got, we're big in nuclear, as I'm sure uh, Andrew's, Andrew's uh, you well know from Andrew, we're big in wind. Um, we've got massive port facilities that, uh, you know, can su support all sorts of shipping. Um, it, what, what problems or, or materials should the North specifically be focusing on or maybe championing for our region? Oh man, <laughs> well, that's a hot, <laughs> you know, I think, a you know, Royce is focused on advanced materials, but actually, if you look at a lot of our industry, it's concrete and steel, <laughs> really. Uh, somewhere in the UK has to re-emerge as a world-leading expert in concrete or area in concrete, and somewhere in the UK has to re-emerge as a world-leading area in steel. And I'm, I'm not talking about exotic steel alloys here. I'm talking about carbon steel, base carbon steel. Uh, um, stainless steels are obviously incredibly important, but, but making some of these things in the optimum way is, is really important. So I, I'm going to be very boring and say concrete and steel. We had one individual who was absolutely adamant that if we – just spent a little bit more money making steel in a more clever way, we could eliminate loads of our problems that we have with steel. I'm not expert enough to know whether that's true or not, but I found that input fascinating. So concrete and steel, Andrew, I'm going to go for. Sorry. Excellent. Well, you, you, you will definitely have to get in touch with MPI down, down the road. Um, well, yes. Well, th thank you very much, Bill. Um, I suppose just picking up on a few things. Do feel free to drop by the Institute and uh, I, I'm sure I'm sure it'll be excellent to have you again, as others have said. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Steve. <laughs> yes, I think we've uh, reached a situation here where you have given, and again, I tend to say this, uh, you've given us a lot to think about. And, you know, to for the UK to be at net zero by 2050, and uh, we intend to be leaders at this, we are already showing, as you said, that we have every intention of doing this and are being reasonably successful. Um, but you done very well for us describing uh, the solutions to the problems which which may be encountered on the on the way to this you know um, namely the structural material degradation and the primary objectives uh, you know not the least being uh, carbon capture in some way um, but I, I thought your approach was absolutely wonderful in the way that uh, you actually asked industries and academia um, on, a, on a questionnaire survey which you weren't given a lot of time to go ahead with this and plan it. I see you, uh, you, know, so you mentioned that. Um, but nonetheless, um, the, re the answers that came back um, look, look very positive. They all seem to have very much the same sort of problems uh, when it comes down to it. You know, you had the uh, 41 respondents with uh, 123 inputs, but most of them seem centered on uh, the, the, the same eight sectors. And, and no showstoppers, as you said, which was absolutely marvelous. Um, the degradation topics, you know, which you covered uh, were, were very wide, um, but could still be reduced to really just one thing, corrosion all the way. Um, I, I loved your uh, insistence on the fact that uh, concrete seems to be the major problem with 8% of the GDP of the world, you know, could be saved in concrete. Heavens above that is that is an amazing piece of information, and we should all be you know, doing everything we can to, you know, to further this, as you uh, said in your closing statement. Absolutely wonderful. Um, but uh, it's also, you know, it's, it's so expensive for uh, corrosion, and, you know, I can see why you're pushing it so hard. Um, but, uh, again, the, the UK is strong in research and uh, production facilities, um, but you did tell us that uh, we need to be... Uh, uh, a long, have a longer term approach and that we, uh, our views need to be much more holistic uh, and particularly to share data so we can move along so much faster. 
uh, and that can be achieved by very strong leadership and lots more funding. So uh, let's, let's hope that we can get somewhere uh, on those topics anyway and that things will move forward so much faster because what you're doing is so essential to our futures or our children's futures uh, for some of us, Andrew. Uh, the younger ones. <laughs> so, you know, on that, um, can I ask you all to show your appreciation to Bill for his wonderful lecture tonight and show it in the usual Zoom manner, probably by waving a hand. And thank you very much indeed, Bill. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I wonder if I could uh, ask um, Andrew to give a report uh, uh, on the next meeting. Next meeting. Uh, no, it's it's all to be all to be arranged. Uh, it's the AGM and presidential lecture on the sixteenth of September. Further details, depending on what uh, what happens, uh, will be announced in due course. Uh, but apart from that, so I suppose enjoy it. Everyone who can enjoy their summer holiday. Now. Yes, yes. What a wonderful thought. <laughs> Well, as a closing remark, thank you again, everyone, for coming along, and particularly Catherine, who I failed to mention there. Uh, thank you very much for coming along, because I can see by the faces that are on the top screens there that everyone enjoyed this, and it's given everyone a lot to think about, and it's given a little bit more focus on exactly what is going to happen with our materials in the future. So once again, Bill, thank you very, very much, and thank you, everyone, for coming along this evening.